It is a commonplace of Italian Renaissance art history that human anatomy played a vital role in the art of the period. Much of this is obvious from a mere glance at Italian Renaissance sculpture and painting, where everything from the proportions of the body to the depiction of its surfaces reflect a fuller awareness of actual bodies. Such works demonstrate artists' interest in the structure of the skeleton muscles, veins, and sinews, which they gleaned through both anatomical dissection and observation of living persons. Yet with the singular exception of Leonardo da Vinci, considerably less attention has been paid to the study of internal anatomy by artists. This is presumably for the obvious reason that internal anatomical features are not visible on the outsides of bodies and thus may appear to be of secondary interest to artists. Today, however, I would like to show the ways in which internal anatomy did matter to several artists working in the Cinquecento. Led by the example of Michelangelo, these artists, including Agnolo Bronzino, Daniele Dal Volterra, and Pellegrino Tobaldi, often referred to inner anatomical features in their works. And by determining where and why these artists figured internal anatomy we can rethink various stereotypes surrounding the so-called mannerist body in which the distortions of anatomy have often been considered as motivated only by aesthetic considerations. To ground my discussion, I would like to survey some of my work on Michelangelo, who I believe fully established and legitimated the practice of paying attention to inner anatomical matters and whose example influenced many other artists in both his art and poetry. Michelangelo regularly highlighted the liver, heart, and brain. Like many medieval and early modern anatomists, Michelangelo recognized these three organs as the primary internal centers of anatomy with regards to contemplation of spiritual and terrestrial things. However, Michelangelo's understanding of them was eclectic and was certainly not dependent exclusively or even primarily on the work, excuse me. On the work of practicing or professional anatomists. For although Michelangelo was a close friend of the anatomist Rialdo Colombo, and carried out many dissections throughout his career, he was also deeply invested in poetic, theological, and philosophical traditions that took up issues of internal anatomy in a variety of contexts beyond the professional confines of the discipline. He used these varied sources to develop a personal and context-specific inner anatomical poetics, wherein individual artworks might resonate within particular discourses about the body taken from a range of sources. Thus, for example, a religious painting might take up ideas about the heart discussed in theological and devotional texts, rather than paying heed to anatomical treatises and related medical ideas. Oftentimes, Michelangelo gleaned what he knew about the internal organs from discussions in poetry or devotional literature as well. Above all, he was aware of relevant passages concerning anatomy in the works of St. Augustine and Dante. A few visual examples will serve to flesh out these points. The first is a highly finished presentation drawing of the punishment of Titius that Michelangelo gave to the young Roman nobleman Tommaso Cavalieri, with whom the artist was infatuated. It shows the giant Titius in Hades, where he was confined eternally for attempting to rape the goddess Latona. As punishment, a bird of prey would eat his regenerating liver once a day in the manner of Prometheus. In the drawing, there can be no doubt that the bird is about to begin its feeding, and the position of its head and beak generally indicates where most early modern persons would place the liver in the upper part of the proper right torso near the bottom of the rib cage. You may wonder why the liver was chosen. 
The liver's connection to carnal desire was an idea held by many poets of the later Middle Ages and Renaissance who went out of their way to discuss the physiological aspects of love in their verses, as did Guido Cavalcante and Dante, among others. Indeed, many poets put together accounts of how beauty and love affected a person by way of such anatomical processes. Central to these discussions was naturally the heart, for then as now, the heart was the central anatomical metaphor of love. But more surprisingly, to us today, the liver was also regularly singled out as the real seat of the sex drive. Examples abound, but I can immediately point to Petrarch's Africa, in which Petrarch tells how Cupid aimed his arrows not at the heart, but at the liver. Although the heart could be the seat of higher forms of love, the liver was the organ that generated lust. This connection between the liver and carnal desire was taken up elsewhere in Michelangelo's artwork. In his dying slave, for instance, we see a sensual figure who is either swooning or asleep, forcefully verticalized, bound upright with slender ribbons or ties. Although left unfinished with the rest of the artist's first ensemble for the tomb of Pope Julius II, the dying slave is frequently described as a work that proves Michelangelo's concern for the body, above all on account of its naturalistic musculature. Yet, I have argued that its references to internal anatomy are also important. To put things briefly, I believe that in The Dying Slave, Michelangelo calls attention to the liver by way of the placement of the figure's languid hand over the lower right rib cage. I believe that Far from being an arbitrary choice, Michelangelo placed the hand in this way to highlight the source of the figure's evident sensuality. To the question of why the artist would show a sensual figure on a papal tomb, I would reply that the figure presumably represented Pope Julius II's spiritual triumph over earthly concerns. The sculpture in its total ensemble would have shown how Julius's virtuous mind conquered and thus righted the wayward carnal instincts of the body by putting mind over matter, that is the brain over the liver. Other references to internal anatomy by Michelangelo are more straightforward. Once recognized, they cannot be easily dismissed or forgotten. In fact, we can find one on the Sistine ceiling. There, Michelangelo painted a representation of the brazen serpent that clearly references internal organs. In the triangular field of a pendentive, the artist painted the bronze serpent erected by Moses to save the Israelites who were being attacked by poisonous snakes as they wandered in the desert. The faithful Israelites on the left make the choice to worship the brazen serpent as God had commanded, and they are thereby healed, while the unfaithful ones on the right do not pay the image any heed, therefore dying from the venomous bites. You'll notice that the liver is again the site of sin in the fresco, as indicated by the body of a man whose liver area is viciously gnawed on by a snake. However, I would like to draw your attention to the figures of the faithful on the left. There you will see two instances where one person points to another person's brain or heart. Specifically, you will notice a baby sitting on his father's shoulders while indicating his father's forehead, and a man supporting the arm of a woman with his left hand while pointing to her heart with his right. I hope you will agree that these gestures are too specific to be brushed off as somehow casually done or without further significance. At the very least, we must admit that Michelangelo intended to show how the image of the brazen serpent, which was compared to Christ's cross in the New Testament, was meant to work on the faithful Israelites who fix its image in their hearts and minds. After all, the brazen serpent was intended as an image of faith that would bring salvation to God's people by way of its very contemplation. By choosing to look upon it and then revere it, the venerator was choosing God, and that was his or her means of salvation. But I think we can go further in the explanation of these gestures towards the brain and heart. I think that Michelangelo is here making reference by way of body language 
to early modern thinking about the internalization of images as described in contemporary faculty psychology, which he could have easily known from places like Landino's commentary on Dante's Divine Comedy. In this and other sources, Michelangelo would have seen that Aristotelian faculty psychology had been grafted onto Galenic anatomy. According to this tradition of anatomical faculty psychology, every idea that is put before the mind had its corresponding image in the brain, and that there could be no cognition at all without images there. Thus the image received in the frontmost anterior ventricle of the brain would then be judged in the second central ventricle located behind it in the center of the head. There the image would be judged or cogitated sparking two further things in the body. It would generate a memory which was lodged in the last or posterior ventricle of the brain and it would generate a movement of the will by sending a message of approval or disapproval from the central ventricle of the brain to the heart, which would then inspire the body to propel itself towards or away from the image by way of quasi-physical vapors called spirits. It seems to me that this is exactly the process that we see at work in the fresco, where the man with the child at the top has received the image in his anterior ventricle at the outset of the process just described. The woman, in turn, whose heart is indicated by the man supporting her, shows the realization of the potential of that image in her worshipful body movement towards the brazen serpent. The last example that I would like to mention here is a collaborative work, which Michelangelo designed and Jacopo Pontormo then painted. It is a representation of the so-called Nole Me Tangre, the event in the Gospel of John in which Mary Magdalene, upon recognizing Christ after his resurrection, attempts to touch him, only to be told that she should not. The paradox of, the, of this image is that Christ does exactly what he tells the Magdalene not to do, namely he touches her. Although the image is hard to read in reproductions, Christ's finger not only points to the Magdalene's left breast, but actually indents the cloth over it. The gesture is most easily observed in situ before the work in the Casa Buonarroti in Florence. But you need not agree that Christ's finger touches the Magdalene to accept the fact that his finger indicates the breast and likely the heart underneath it. And the explanation for this gesture happens in this case to come from St. Augustine. Augustine writes in his commentary on John's gospel where the event is recorded, that at the moment of the Nole Me Tangre, Christ planted a seed of faith in the Magdalene's heart. Following Augustine's interpretation, Michelangelo has therefore placed the organ of faith in the heart, not the brain. As I have already stated, Michelangelo often adapted the organ of his address in his images, depending on the needs of context of the work in question. In this specific sacral case, Augustine, rather than say Aristotle, was his point of reference. I will have occasion to speak about other images by Michelangelo that take up inner anatomical matters of this kind later. But what I would like to do now with the rest of my time is discuss the ways in which other artists, many of them Florentine and associated with Michelangelo in his style, made use of similar gestures to speak to internal anatomy. This is new research, and I hope to demonstrate that many of these artists' organ-related figurations follow the pattern and meaning of Michelangelo's examples, although I will also note when they do not do so. Michelangelo's impact on younger Florentine artists cannot be overstated. Even after his definitive departure for Rome in 1534 from Florence, he was universally recognized as capo of the Florentine school. Certainly his tremendous impact on other Florentine artists was already evident by the late 1520s or early 1530s, when painters like the aforementioned Jacopo Pontormo and his pupil Agnolo Bronzino came under his spell. Busy designing and executing work for the Medici at San Lorenzo before his departure, Michelangelo chose to share out some additional commissions, first executing executing designs for works like the Nole Me Tangre on the screen, and then handing them over to Pontormo to render in paint. In 
In awe of the older master, Pontormo developed an almost disciple-like investment in what he saw as Michelangelo's principles, including Michelangelo's devotion to the human body. It was a matter, it was a pattern that the two developed further in another collaborative work with internal anatomical resonances, the Venus and Cupid, now housed in the Academia. And I want to emphasize that both these works featured hands pointing to hearts. Yet, it was Pontormo's pupil, Bronzino, who fully absorbed Michelangelo's figural language of the internal body, alongside healthy doses of Michelangelo's anatomically invested poetry, to become an artist poet in the same vein, as if in imitation of him. It is by way of Bronzino, in fact, that we know that Michelangelo's learned art, informed as it was by Tuscan poetry and other intellectual discourses, came to have a certain status as the Florentine language of the figure. Instilled by the same tradition of Tuscan love poetry with its heavy investment in anatomical matters, Bronzino was not only in a position to understand Michelangelo's figuration of inner anatomical things like a humanist such as Benedetto Varchi, but also in the position to make use of it himself. Bronzino's approach to Michelangelo likewise aligned with the growing Medicean program for promoting a specifically Tuscan cultural identity by way of its patronage. The cultural sophistication of the Florentine schools painted and sculpted products would thus be reflected in their attachment to specifically Florentine traditions of poetic discourse and anatomical metaphor. One can gauge Bronzino's attachment to Michelangelo's example in the frescoes he painted for the chapel of Eleonora of Toledo in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. Bronzino's representation of, of the brazen serpent there is particularly beholden to the older master. Michelangelo would have been an obvious reference point given the rarity of the subject matter. And indeed, Bronzino has first conjured and then rethought many aspects of Michelangelo's own portrayal. Instead of arranging good and bad Israelites on the left and right of the composition, Bronzino places the good Israelites above the bad ones. Although we do not see the conspicuous pointing to organs here that we saw in Michelangelo's work, we no nonetheless find that one snake gnaws the torso of a a fallen Israelite in the region, region of the liver, just as we saw on the Sistine ceiling. Taken by itself, this is hardly proof of Bronzino's investment in inner anatomical matters. After all, there are many elegantly distorted bodies and limbs here that add balletic or ceremonial resonance to more straightforward activities, enhancing their beauty or grandeur without signaling some deeper message. But there are other places in Bronzino's work where we can be more certain of the artist Michelangelo's investment in internal anatomy. I believe this can be seen in the nearly contemporary Joseph tapestries, where Bronzino made use of gestures with purpose, assuming some of Michelangelo's own inner anatomical language. In one of these tapestries, the Joseph interprets the dream of Pharaoh, we see the young Joseph engaged in an act of inspired interpretation, signaled by his pointing hands, his left hand indicating the significance of the dream, his right pointing in the direction of his own interior ventricle behind the forehead. This gestural language makes clear the activity of discernment in itself in the imagination. This gestural language, <clears throat> thus Joseph's body tells us about the faculty psychological and inner anatomical factors involved in the act of interpretation. As the image strikes his brain at the front, his intellect following the imagination can then judge of its significance for Pharaoh. And there are other tapestries where figures gesture to organs in the mode of Michelangelo's figurative language that make such actions clear. In Joseph receiving Benjamin, Joseph embraces his brother, pointing to the posterior ventricle of the brain, the back of Benjamin's head, while Benjamin points to Joseph's heart. The two gestures designate the two centers of memory and thus recognition in the period's anatomy, the brain and the heart. 
Furthermore, the heart will follow the promptings of memory in this case. And so the embrace outlines the physiological underpinnings of the psychological situation. And here I rush to say that we need not doubt that Bronzino understood the idea that memory was located at the back of the head, for it has been established that this figure of oblivion and the London allegory of Venus is missing that part of her head for this very reason. Oblivion neither makes nor stores memories and thus does not need the back part of her brain. I think that the language of internal and anatomical matters that we are spotting in these cases might be discovered in one final ta tapestry, the jo Joseph and Potiphar's wife. We have already spoken of the liver as the anatomical seat of, in the body of lust and lustful impulses. When Potiphar's wife seeks to seduce Joseph, she grabs his cloak, hoping to pull him towards her. You will notice too that she grabs at the very spot above the liver on the proper right side of his torso. Joseph's hand meets hers there to pry it away. And thus the two hands contest control of this area of his body. Given how we have observed Bronzino make use of these gestures in the other tapestries from the series and other works from his contemporary output, I think the reading is compelling which leads me to argue that in the Joseph tapestries, Bronzino takes up and explores most of the inner anatomical territory that Michelangelo had already covered in his own work. Like Michelangelo, Bronzino judged that an educated Florentine observer could easily make out what these gestural configurations mean. Having introduced Michelangelo's inner anatomical poetics to his works of the 1540s and 50s, Bronzino continued to take up such matters in the last two decades of his life. Surveying his work from the 1560s, one finds an instance of this continuing interest in his deposition. The figuration in question here leads from the dead hand of Christ configured again in imitation of the gesture of Michelangelo's Adam on the Sistine ceiling to the heart of the mourning Mary Magdalene on the right. The reference point for this gesture almost inevitably is Michelangelo and Pontormo's Nole Me Tangere that we discussed earlier. As I mentioned then, the Nole Me Tangere surely alluded to Augustine's appraisal of the event in which he says that at the moment that Christ tells the Magdalene not to touch him, he plants a seed of faith in her heart. In Bronzino's deposition, Mary Magdalene supports Christ's hand in hers as if to direct it to herself, so as to use it to indicate her own heart thereby. It is possible that a patristic or hagiographic reading of the gesture in this particular context is possible too, but we already can make conjectures based on the painting's precedence. For example, we might reasonably decide that even in death, Christ does the work of instilling faith in the Magdalene's breast, or we might determine that the work shows us that his broken body imprints itself in her heart on account of her great sorrow. In Michelangelo's brazen serpent, the signaled heart shows a conviction of will following upon the intellect's judgment of a divine image. But it is less important for me now to arrive at a definitive reading of the heart signaling in this picture than to point out that such a reading can reasonably be performed, that Bronzino has joined his figurative language to an inner anatomical poetics in this painting. In his final work, The Raising of the Daughter of Jairus, Bronzino uses the same inner anatomical poetics one last time. The scriptural subject of the painting was an appropriate one to take on in this way because it has to do with internal spiritual matters as much as external ones. According to scripture, Jairus, who was the ruler of his synagogue, begged Christ to heal his dying daughter, who subsequently passes away before Jesus can get to her. Although it is feared that nothing now can be done, Christ reassures her family that faith alone is necessary to bring her back to life, stating, fear not, believe only, and she shall be safe. That's from Luke 8, verse 50. Then taking Peter, James, and John with him into the house, 
Jesus raises Jairus' daughter to life again, ordering that food be brought for her and telling her family to tell no one about what has happened. Bronzino's portrayal of the event does not make Christ the geometric center of this more or less square composition. Rather, Bronzino presents an intricate gestural scenario here. Indeed, it is the space between several gestures that occupies the middle of the altarpiece. The emptying space speaks to the unseen element of faith that is key to the whole scenario. Below the vacant middle, Christ takes the young woman's hand, raising her from her bed and back to life again. Above it, his pointing right hand indicates the woman's brow. Jesus turns to look downwards towards the kneeling Jairus, who spreads his arms in astonishment while staring intently at Christ's face. His wife standing above him points joyously upwards, showing the direction of her husband's focus and connecting it beyond Christ with the heavens. Like her father, the daughter lifts her eyes towards Christ's face. Although not the geometric center of the panel, Christ's countenance becomes the aspiration of eyes here, an image for worship and thus the real image of faith that saves the viewer the painting who can discern what is happening. The anatomical dimensions of the impact of Christ's face are registered simultaneously by the pointing hand of St. John on the left, whose finger, here again extended in the fashion of Michelangelo's Adam, provides something like a synopsis of what has occurred by way of his explanation to St. Peter, who stands in back of him. Indeed, John's arcing finger links Christ's gesturing hand and thus the daughter's forehead to the person of Jairus himself on the right. It makes the point that what has happened depended on Jairus's faith as scripture emphasizes. In this way, we see Jairus's faith in Christ, inspired by Christ's faith, can be linked to the implantation of the same image in his daughter's brow. Like the famous so-called dreamer in Michelangelo's Del Sogno, who receives an angelic trumpet blast to his forehead awakening him in the traditional Neoplatonist reading to the higher moral life of the soul, Christ's gesture towards the forehead of the girl speaks to the implantation of the seed of an idea, the placing of an image of inspiration before the mind. You will recall that the situation was already glossed in compelling detail in Michelangelo's Brazen Serpent, where the baby points to his father's forehead as his father gazes upon the image which itself was understood as a prefiguration of Christ. As we have also seen, Bronzino knew of this fresco and made use of Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling imagery here in the hand of St. John, not to mention in his own rendition of the brazen serpent that I projected earlier. Bronzino must have been aware that he was tackling a motif whose resonance Michelangelo had clearly established before him. It was faith in the brazen serpent that according to scripture allow the salvation of the Israelites. And so it is faith in Christ that enables the healing of res or resurrection of Jairus's daughter as well. <clears throat> in any case, I think the foregoing examples prove that Bronzino was far from immune to the inner anatomical poetics that Michelangelo had made central to Florentine art by way of his artistic and cultural authority. No doubt it was Michelangelo's investment in particularly Tuscan sources that had done much to endear him to the city's Cinquecento intellectual and cultural elites, leading to the appropriation of some of his anatomical language by Bronzina. But I want to move on to another artist, a sometime pupil of Michelangelo, whose work shows the impact of Michelangelo's inner anatomical ideas. I am speaking now about Daniele da Volterra. In treating Daniele, I will focus on one particular work, an altarpiece of the Annunciation in the Prado that is attributed to him. It is a work that unsurprisingly is filled with Michelangelisms. The Michelangelisms in the present work include the Puto behind God the Father at the top who wears wings, but must be derived from the baby, often identified as Christ before his incarnation, behind God the Father in the creation of Adam. But what I am most concerned about is the figuration of internal anatomy in this devotional work, 
which also depends on Michelangelo's example. You see, towards the end of his long life, Michelangelo made two designs for, annunci for annunciations that were then rendered into two separate altarpieces by the artist Marcello Venusti. Are, they are of interest to us because in them, Gabriel addresses his salutation to Mary's heart and brain, respectively. I have determined that Gabriel's gestures again reference St. Augustine, who had said that the incarnation proceeded first in Mary's mind before her womb, so that depending on whether one placed the soul in the heart of the brain, an issue unresolved at this time, there was a figuration that would work for you. Now, the painter of the present Annunciation, Daniele da Volterra, clearly was aware of this inner anatomical figurative language in Michelangelo's work. He also was clearly interested in Augustine's notion of the double incarnation, that is the spiritual art incarnation in the mind followed by the carnal one in the womb. But what's most interesting to us here is that Daniele decides to have both our organs, brain and heart, play a role in his painting. He does not want to choose. So whereas the Virgin gestures towards her own heart, Gabriel's blessing hand also indicates the front of her forehead and thus the brain's anterior ventricle. This is a work that actively seeks then to reconcile two designs by Michelangelo and make sense of them together, merging what Michelangelo clearly must have viewed as two separate but legitimate responses to the spiritual incarnation of Christ in Mary's mind. In this case, I do not think we need further textual support. The visual image being convincing enough in itself to show Michelangelo's inner anatomical poetics was being developed and even improved on by others. Indeed, I am quite convinced that Daniele's audience would have understood not only the theological reference to Augustine's interpretation of the Annunciation, but also the prestigious artistic sources even appreciating Daniele's inclusive resolution of the impasse presented by the fact that Michelangelo made two different renderings. I would like to end today's talk by speaking about one last artist, the Bolognese painter Pellegrino Tibaldi, for his example shows the wider spectrum of artists and works that could carry inner anatomical resonances in the Cinquecento. Now it is well known that Tibaldi was deeply invested in Michelangelo's painting. As Morton Steen Hansen has shown, Tibaldi moved between deep reverence for and ironic fascination with the older artist's works and reputation. And some of Tibaldi's evocations of Michelangelo even appear as travesties. Take for example, his fresco of the blinding of Polyphemus, an episode from Homer's Odyssey, which clearly takes the famous recumbent Adam of the Sistine ceiling as its starting point, and then violently desacralizes it in stunning fashion. Tibaldi's response may have seemed a healthy one, given the unhealthy weight of Michelangelo's influence on himself and other mannerist painters. But there is at least one place in Tibaldi's work, specifically <clears throat> another painting depicting the Odyssey, in which we may observe that Michelangelo's inner anatomical poetics found a home. In his portrayal of Ulysses before Queen Arete at the court of the Phaeacians, Tibaldi shows the kneeling Odysseus before the queen and king in their palace. Queen Arete makes an appeal to her husband for help on Odysseus's behalf. She gestures backwards as if to indicate Odysseus's long travails while pointing to the top center of Odysseus's head. In so doing, she does not merely designate his person, but also his brain. As with the other cases that we have looked at, her finger specifically seems to portend something important. And I believe that Tibaldi sought here to make clear that it was Odysseus's judgment, his intellect housed in the central ventricle of his brain, that is of primary concern to the queen. It is Tibaldi's way of emphasizing that Odysseus the craftiest of human heroes depended ultimately on his mind for his survival through so many trials on his long journey home to Ithaca from Troy. This last example has taken us far from the original works with which I began this inquiry. Yet I think it particularly valuable because it seems to indicate the way in which this inner anatomical poetics of the body 
worked beyond Michelangelo, that is beyond Florence and Rome and their environs. But I think these examples inspired by artists working in Michelangelo's shadow also point to a degree of difference. Although no viewer would want to accuse Michelangelo of relentless naturalism, it remains the case that his postures and gestures generally manage to look rather natural, even despite their famous difficulta. And most especially when compared to their equivalents by the artist Bronzino, Daniele da Volterra, and above all, Pellegrino Tobaldi. What is more, the works of these three artists often demonstrated a very deliberate artificiality by way of citation of Michelangelo and other prestigious works of art that underlined their unnatural nature. As my final contribution in this talk then, I would like to propose that this artificiality was not only formally attractive to contemporary viewers, but also a matter of necessity. By underlining a gesture's artificiality, or enhancing its unnatural character, these three artists, I would suggest, hope to point out that the gestures themselves were part of an artificial language, referencing not nature, but culture. In this way, I believe that their figurations have the arbitrary aspect of a language, that by way of its overdetermined and self-conscious forms showed that they were not meant to be merely looked at, but also read. In this strange way, the Renaissance's admiration of anatomical naturalism had truly led far away from its inspiration in real bodies. You might even say that Michelangelo's interest in internal anatomy paradoxically helped to promote the anti-natural impulses of mannerist art more generally. Thank you. Mm -hmm.